Your game is about to get a wake-up call. Hello, and welcome to the Red Rooster Golf Podcast. Alongside company founder Carrie Moher, I am Brad Fritch, former PGA Tour player, current Corn Ferry Tour member, and Red Rooster founding partner. Red Rooster Golf, join us in waking up your golf glove game, an oft-neglected part of your equipment, and yet ever-present on each and every shot you hit. Learn to manage your glove. Make sure it's there to help you and change it when it's not. Red Rooster Golf. Wake up, shake up, step up, and give. Mr. Kerry Moher, how are you, buddy? Great, man. Really, really enjoyed the conversation with Adam. It was a treat. Oh, man. He's uh, he's such a good guy. Uh, we we traveled a bit together uh, early on in his career. I was well into mine. Um, played a lot together, and uh, can't wait to to interview him. So, without further ado, we are delighted, overjoyed, and just plain happy to welcome PGA Tour player, my former roommate, traveling companion, Adam Hadwin. Adam, how are you, buddy? I'm fantastic, guys. How are you? Really, really good. Well, this is a timely uh, interview because you're yeah. just off a uh, a second place finish at the Zurich Classic, the team event where you teamed with your, I'm assuming he's a very old friend of yours because you're from the same yeah. club in Ab- Abbotsford, BC, um, Nick Taylor. I texted you after the round and I said, I'm so sorry because... The only shot I watched was Nick's missed about six footer on 18. I don't think it, I don't think it made a difference. Right. I, I think they beat you by two or three. They beat us by two. Yeah. Beach, so it didn't you by two. costing okay. anything. Yep. So it wasn't my fault, but uh, what a week for you guys. Uh, how, yeah. how are you, how are you feeling? Because it's been, you know, c- can I call it an uneven year so far for you? Yeah, I would say a bit of an up and down one. Um, a lot of, really good golf at times that I don't think I fully capitalized on during those events. Right. I mean, I was, you know, in the final group on Saturday in Phoenix and could only muster an even par round. And I guess it was what third last group, maybe or fourth last group in the final round. And again, could only muster an even par round. Um, so even one or two shots there would have got me to six their solo six. Um, and when you start getting into these elevated events, uh, that's a lot. Um, not just money, but FedEx or uh, FedEx points, world ranking points, all of that. Um, and then I did something similar at players where um, I had opportunities to do it and, and um, just, just a little off at the end. Um, like I said, just couldn't capitalize maybe on a couple of the opportunities. I still had great weeks by, by any stretch. Um, but yeah, like, when you're playing weeks like that and you're playing well, that one shot is so big. Um, and can mean so much. I, I don't want to like, this is, this is just me guessing. I didn't go calculate or ask anybody for a calculation, but you know, one shot higher in Phoenix and one shot higher in the players. I think I would have had a decent chance to get into the masters. So, you know, when you, when you look back on that kind of stuff, it, it kind of adds up and it might make you think might have a slight different outlook on the way things have gone this year, but, um, yeah, it's, it's been okay. Um, kind of like you said, a lot of good things, but yeah, to partner up with Nick last week, we played, I'd say we probably played really good partner golf. Um, I don't, you know, Nick was probably playing a little bit better than I was. I, there's a, probably a good chance that I missed the cut last week if I wasn't playing a team event. Um, so I give Nick a lot of, (laughs) yeah, I know. I give Nick a lot of credit for kind of holding us in there. Um, you know, like the the first day, the best ball day, I wouldn't like, neither of us were really taking it deep by any stretch. I mean, I think, you know, we, we had seven birdies as a team. I think I was three, he was four. Um, but some of the other hole, I was, I was probably over par on my own golf ball that day. Um, and, uh, but yeah, we certainly got it going on Sunday. Um, and that was a lot of fun to be a part of. Does it help? you adam to know that your best finishes outside of zurich have been these massive events in phoenix and the players like you're battling against the absolute best fields and those are your best finishes yeah definitely 
Um, you know, I've always thought, and I think most of us do that, you know, when we're playing our best that we can compete against the best. And, um, but yeah, I mean, it certainly helps. I've, I've played well now the players the last two years, which is arguably one of the best fields in golf. Um, you know, which on a golf course that I think is a really good golf course too. Um, I think that it demands a lot out of your game. And, uh, so yeah, to play well, especially in an event like that. Uh, for the last couple of years is, is a big bonus. And, and, you know, we're always going to go in that like ebb and flow and good times and bad times a little bit, unless you're John Rom or Scotty Scheffler who just play well every time it seems like, but um, yeah, to kind of show up on the bigger moments, it feels pretty good. Yeah. Th- I mean, those are two events that, that I watch pretty closely. Maybe talk about those. You know, I've, I've played TPC Sawgrass, played it with Brad, found it to be so visually intimidating and uh you know any sort of mistake gets magnified and you you mentioned you've been playing well there the last couple of years but speak to kind of how you played this year you kind of got off to that that hot start and and walk us through maybe like the tournament as a whole because it's it's so tough because you get these runs there and Mm -hmm. you know you never want to like take too much for granted because you can give so much back so fast. Yeah. Um, I mean, Pete Dye does an incredible job of, of making you think that you have nothing when you have loads of room. Um, like you said, the visually intimidate, the visual intimidation that he presents off a tee box, uh, he's kind of famed for, and there is quite a bit of room. Uh, you just don't feel like you have it. And so you have to kind of get over that part to be successful. I think, um, you know, this year in, in particular, it was, it was playing difficult, um, which I think plays into my hands a little bit more, obviously Scotty kind of ran away with it on the weekend and, and didn't make it much of a chair, um, a challenge for him, I guess. But, you know, I was, um, I kind of just played steady golf, um, all week, um, I didn't think that I did anything too flashy. I just didn't make any big mistakes, Um, which also speaks to your point of there's a lot of risk reward around that place. Um, If you're aggressive and you pull off shots, you're going to have good looks at Eagle. You're going to have good looks at birdie. Um, And you can, you know, jump up the leaderboard pretty quickly. If you take on that and you don't pull it off, uh, bogeys and doubles await quite quickly. Um, and you can, and you can rack them up fast. Um, even the, even the short holes, the ones that you expect to birdie, um, you know, one miscalculation or one missed shot and it's pretty well a bogey right away. And so I felt like I did a really good job of, I'm not an aggressive player by nature anyways. Um, which again, you know, going into a tournament like that, if one of the more aggressive players, a Scotty or a John Rom, if they're on and they're pulling off those shots, it's going to be very difficult for me to beat them that week, just because I don't hit it as far. So I don't take as many um, chances into the par fives, a little bit more strategic, a little bit more uh, conservative. Um, but it also lends to me having, you know, really good solid weeks potentially without some of my best stuff because mm-hmm. I don't make the big, big mistakes like some guys would. I would think that kind of comes with the, I'm not going to say lack of length, but you're, I guess, below average length on tour, right? (laughs) Um, You can say it. But but, I mean, every other part of your game, I was thumbing through your stats today and every other part of your game besides your distance off the tee is in the, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, Your par three scoring over the last gosh, five, six, seven years. Like that's the one that jumps out to me. So obviously your iron play is top of top of the tour, basically, especially when you're able to put it on a tee and you're putting inside 10 feet. uh, And I think I recall this from the time we played a lot together, pretty darn solid. Um, What is kind of what's, (laughs) what's working right now for you at this very moment? Um, You know, I think that again, we talk about that ebb and flow. Uh, my iron game, when I first started working with Mark, got really strong again. I really started controlling my ball a lot better. Um, I would say that's kind of fallen off a little bit. Uh, I'm just not hitting the amount of greens that I would have 
would expect, which, you know, if I can continue to hit greens and just give myself opportunity, you know, Brad, you just touched on that. Um, I'm usually a pretty decent putter. Um, so it lends itself to a lot of good scores. Um, I think that, uh, you know, overall, again, my putting has been, you know, really good for the last five, six years now. Um, I've trended towards that top 50 number. There's been a few years, I think even in the top 20 or 25. Um, so the putting has been fairly consistent. It kind of comes and goes a little bit depending on grass potentially, but, um, I've started driving the better or driving the golf ball a lot better these last three, four months, maybe. Um, and typically I've been a pretty decent driver of the golf ball. I just, like you mentioned, I lack a little bit of distance, um, comparatively. So my strokes gained off the tee is never, I don't think I'll ever reach a John Rom where I'm gaining one, one and a half strokes off the tee. I just, at my length, it's just not possible. Um, to be honest with you, my goal going into this year was to be positive. That was it. If I could be positive strokes gained off the tee, um, it would likely mean that I'm hitting a lot of fairways and giving myself a lot of opportunities to do some good things. So, um, you know, I'd like my short game to be a little bit tighter. Um, it's still not bad. Um, but that's obvious. That's always going to be my bread and butter. Um, and so, yeah, I picked up the driving a little bit. Now I just need to kind of grind on the irons a little bit more, start hitting a few more greens and, and giving myself a few more, a few more opportunities to just take some pressure off of some of the other areas, um, to make life a little bit less stressful. Adam, what do you see with like your, your putting, especially your, your inside 10 feet, those are, you know, your world-class. So is that something that you've been working on? Have you always been a good putter? Has that been a strength of your game? Like my, my putting is atrocious. It's just like, it's the worst <laughs> part. And of course I never spend any time on it. Uh, I'm constantly not. like, I'm changing putters. I'm going to left hand low. I'm trying the claw. Um, what is it with, with putting? Like, were, were you always good? Is it something that you figured out? Do you have anything to share? <laughs> Brad hasn't helped you at all yet. Hey, good, good golf coach there. <laughs> well, we're in different, uh, we're in different countries, Adam. So I, I try when I can, but, uh, not, not yet. He's, not he's yet. holding um, it. I, I yeah. think there's okay. a tip he's waiting to give me. <laughs> he's probably waiting to see what I see. So he's off the hook. Um, no, honestly, it, it just came from hard work. That was pretty much it. Um, as a junior, I was a horrendous putter. I okay. would be, I was, yeah, I was the junior golfer that would shoot 70, 70 with 36 putts because I would hit every fairway, every green and I two putt, you know, and, and likely throw in a three putt. So, okay. um, yeah, it took, um, a solid amount of just dedication to, and I don't really, I, I mean, I'd probably have to go back and, and really think about it, but I don't think that I changed much, uh, like setup wise or anything like that. I do, I do remember going left hand low, maybe back in and around 2012 ish, late 2011, 2012. Cause I think Canadian open at Shaughnessy when I played well, I was still conventional. Okay. Um, but it wasn't much longer after that. I don't think that I went to left hand low. And I've been that way since I've, I haven't gone back. Um, I have gone through a few different style of putters, but each putter that I've used has been probably at least a couple years worth of putting with it. Um, I've been in the model that I'm in now for gosh, three or four years. Wow. Um, yeah, I have played. I have played around with little different things. Like I have, I have the same putter, same model with a slightly different grip on it. Um, I also have the same model of putter with a slightly different shaft bend going like a slightly different hosel going into the putter. And that's just simply, you know, every once in a while, and you guys both know this, you play enough golf that you use something the same and it gets a, little stale and you're not making putts that even just a little bit different of a look, um, can make the world of a difference. And that's why I've kept the same head. I've kept the same weighting, the same grip, everything's the same. It's just a different hosel going into the putter in case I run into that. I haven't yet. 
Um, but I kind of played around with that a little bit, but, um, how I got out of bad putting, I think was the biggest thing was starting as close to the hole as I needed to, to see the ball go in. And, um, I don't think that that gets enough credit. Like, yes, you, you can work on your stroke mechanics and, you know, fitting a putter properly and all these kinds of things. But I think the biggest thing to, to get confidence is just to see the ball going in the hole. You hear that sound, you have to bend over to pick it out of the hole. You get into that motion. Um, and that would be probably some of my biggest advice that I give, could give to anybody is to, I don't care if you have to start at a foot and a half. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter, but start where every putt you're, you're hitting is going in and then start working your way out from there. And I feel like you can start to build confidence in that way. And if you feel to me, if you feel comfortable and you know, you're going to make the short putts, it makes the longer putts easier because you don't have to be perfect. Hmm. If you're worried about, you know, you have a 35 or a 40 footer and you're already worried about the comebacker and you, I have to be perfect in order to two putt, then it's, it's a bit of a, you know, now your speed is completely messed off because there's messed up because there's no, there's no confidence. There's no feel, there's no trust in what you're doing. Um, and I think, you know, those two combined has made me a, a better putter is that I'm really good at short distance and it makes me a better long distance putter and three putt avoidance because I'm really good at short distance, if that makes sense. No, it totally does. Um, anecdotally, that's how I start my warm up when I play any competitive round is hit a few putts that I can't possibly miss, you know, foot and a half, two feet, three feet, and just hear the yeah. ball go in the hole. And once you branch out from there, four, five, six, you might miss one or two, but you start with making every single putt. That's interesting. Um, Absolutely. You, ref you referenced 2011, you turned pro in 2010. Uh, your first win was at your home home club. I saw today a Vancouver golf tour, Ledgeview yeah. golf course. Um, mm -hmm. But you had, you had these amazing high level world-class golf tournaments sprinkled throughout your mini tour and, and Canadian tour career. You had an amazing first Canadian open. Uh, you were in, you, you started your next Canadian open in second place on the final day at Shaughnessy. Um, you were getting sponsor exemptions as a Canadian tour player into PGA tour events. You finished seventh at the fries.com open. And then you go to Q school and finish 100th and you have conditional nationwide tour status. How did you square that in your mind? Like, you know, you have this ultra high level of golf. Everyone knows it. Right. And yet you have, you have to claw from, almost the bottom of, of the nationwide tour. Like how did, how did you feel like you had more money in the bank probably than most guys out there. Right. But that doesn't help with potentially. Yeah. Getting to the next, to the next level. How did you approach kind of your 2000, what was that 2011 12. season, 2012 12. season, which, yeah. which ended with me, like with my yeah. arm around you, we could talk about that yeah. later. Um, this but, close. But, yeah, but how did how did that kind of affect your outlook going into that season? Um, you know, I can think back and I played the the first three rounds of Q school. I played quite well, actually, if memory serves correctly. And uh I was in a great position to get a PGA tour card. I was I think I was in the top thirty through three rounds. Um, so another three solid rounds would have done it. And it just got progressively worse. And um what I do remember from that is that I gave a quote um, to a reporter, I think maybe after day five or something as things were getting bad. And um, uh -oh. he, I think he asked me like, how do you bounce back or what do you do to forget and stuff? I'm like, I don't know. I might just go get hammered tonight or something like that. <laughs> and, um, and uh, I mean, I obviously didn't, but you know, at the time I was just so frustrated. Right. Um, and, uh, I remember doing orientation after Q school as a new, uh, as a new member. And they use that quote on what not to say to people. And I just kind of <laughs> sat there and my face turned red and, yeah. Sure. Um, but I think, you know, obviously at the time I was losing my mind, 
right? Given what had just transpired, right? You mentioned, you know, um, I had played uh, U.S. Open that year, finished like 32nd, uh, got into the Canadian Open, finished fourth, went on to Greenbrier, finished 32nd again, uh, got into the fries.com, finished seventh, which got me into the next week. So I had ended up playing five events and, and really had earned enough to get into Q school. So I had, like you said, I played well, the expectations were certainly there. And, and after three rounds, they were riding even higher. And I think there was definitely a little bit of time there that it took me to get over it. Um, but I think, you know, by the time we had to go tee it up in what end of January, beginning of February, I mean, I think enough time had elapsed that, you know, this is where I'm at. I got to play. Um, you know, this is another opportunity for me to go prove myself. Um, it's not as if the tour is a terrible tour. I didn't feel like I, it was below me by any, by any means. Um, you know, as you know, this game really owes you nothing. Um, and it's all what you want to get out of it. And so, yeah, it, it was, I was ready to go. I was, I mean, on, I, it was a step up, right? I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't going backwards. It was a step mm -hmm. up from where I was. And, uh, yeah, certainly I thought I, you know, at that point felt like maybe not that I deserved a PGA tour card, but certainly playing well enough to be out there. Um, but I think kind of going through 2012, having some success, playing well, being in the position you mentioned it after the tour championship of potentially having a PGA tour card. Um, I think, you know, things happen for a reason and I don't think that I was ready to, to go to the PGA tour. And I think it was probably best that I spend a couple of years um, on the web.com at the time now corn fairy tour. Yeah. I'll let the listeners in on kind of what happened. So I had finished my round at, uh, TPC Craig Ranch, uh, nationwide tour championship, 60 players only. Um, I was in good enough position. I think I was around 18th on the, on the money list for the whole year after my round. It you might fluctuate with a birdie or two from someone else, but I've got my card and Adam is waiting and there's one player who can knock him out. And it's James Hahn and 18 is a par five where you can take a shot at the green and he blows his second shot. Pretty, pretty far right. Way, Way right. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't. <laughs> Way, his, yeah. his, his third shot wasn't a chip shot. It was at right. least a pitch shot. It, yeah, it was a, it was a high, not a flop, but like a high pitch from what, 30 to 40 yards, let's say. And the yeah. pin was on the yeah. right side of the green, not tucked, but he had an unbelievable Eight, shot. Yeah. And we're, we're standing there watching from maybe 50 or 60 yards away. And, and we're just chatting and, and they had a camera in our face because you were the guy on the bubble. Like yeah. James, James makes birdie, you're out. He makes par, you're in. And James makes about a, I think six or seven foot putt, um, knocks you out and, and you handled it really well. I remember that week we stayed in a $37 hotel, $37 <laughs> a night together. So that was pretty good. 1850 a night each. It was, it was really nice. Tell you what, all that, all that, all that penny pinching back then is coming handy now when you start having kids and a family. Oh, there is, there is no doubt. But uh, <laughs> you handled that really well, and I think, I think not necessarily that you're right that you needed more time out there, but those kind of things make you, like they, they make you stronger inside, yeah. and they make you probably want it not necessarily more, but it kind of hardens you, right? Like mm -hmm. if I can handle this, I can handle anything i can handle shooting even par at tpc on a sunday when one or two under would have gotten me in the masters like that kind of stuff you know it it just hardens you like you said golf owes you nothing but the more times you yeah. kind of go through it and then progress after that yeah. it, it makes you such a better player and a better person because you were a, a fiery dude back then and you're, uh, I mean, and it comes with having a family, having a child, you're, you're much more, I see much more mellow on the course and accepting and all those kind of things. But those are all the experiences that kind of play into that progression of attitude, isn't it? No, definitely. Um, yeah, it was, it was a, a very, um, you know, it was an amazing, uh, 
spot to be in, right? You know, we had just kind of like you talked through Q school and stuff and first year out of the web.com and here I am. Holy crap. I finished. I, at the time it was, I was in a two way tie for second at the tour championship and yeah, I'd move. And then James made it a three way tie and there was enough money discrepancy there um, to push me out. But here I am like, Holy, I mean, I probably didn't expect at that point either to have that chance. Right. So to play so well the last week and have a chance, I mean, it, what a cool spot to be in. Um, but yeah, I think, I think what happened is I got a pretty lax, um, with, all right, well, I mean, gosh, I almost got my tour card my first year out here. Give me another year and it'll be no problem. And, uh, I went out in 2013 and barely kept my card. So, <laughs> Um, you know, there was a, I had a stretch in the summer in 2013, I think I went fifth, seventh, and that was basically one of the very few reasons I kept my card. Um, I missed that was 2013, I think was the first year they moved into the playoff system as well. Um, like 25 cards in the regular season and 25 cards in the playoffs. And I like, didn't make a cut in the playoffs either. So I was this close to losing a job again, after having coming this close to being promoted and that was a huge learning experience for me. And I think that's why I say, I don't know if I would have been ready for the tour for the 23rd or for the 2012 season. Um, and honestly, looking back, I would have been, I would worry that if I got out there too early and I wasn't ready for it, that it would have killed all the confidence that I had and who knows where I'd be today. I really do believe that though. Um, I, I obviously believed that I was good and that I could play, but I don't know what finishing 195th on the money list would have done for me. And I'm not saying that would have happened my first year either, but I do know that if I got out on tour and had a year like I did in 2013, I was, you know, I would have struggled and I don't know how I would have handled that mentally. Um, but to be able to go through it there on the web.com and, and fight through it and then come out in 2014, win the money list, I was, riding pretty high going to the tour at that point let me tell you what finishing 200th on the pga tour money <laughs> list feels like adam i can tell you <laughs> uh leads to a lost year the year after that's what it leads to uh go ahead carrie adam i don't know a lot about your your story growing up but it it was cool to watch you and nick and and know that you guys have some background you know, Brad and I, we grew up playing junior golf together and, and it was a great, you know, amazing connection, you know, to this day. And I remember, you know, uh, you know, Brad played at Campbell university and, you know, it's not a top 25 or 30 program. And, um, you know, he didn't even crack, you know, the playing roster, I think his first or, or second year even. Um, but, but every year his game was kind of getting better and um, he was a great player in our region and great player in kind of Quebec, but I, I'm not familiar with, with your story. I, I know Nick's cause that he was, you know, I think at one point he was the number one amateur in the world. Um, and and yeah. British Columbia has always had so many, so many amazing golfers. So Tell us a little bit about like, you know, what were you like as a junior player and how did you get to the university of Louisville and, and what was, what's a bit of that story? Yeah. Uh, so my dad, um, was really how I got started. He was a CPGA for 25 plus years. Um, so my mom was with Sears. We moved around a lot and he would just pick up a, a golf course job, um, and teach. And so that's obviously how, you know, my first introduction to the game, um, I really sort of got interested around it around the age of like 13, 14. I was playing baseball before that and I liked golf, but it wasn't for me at the time. Um, but sort of switched in and kind of started appreciating the individual nature and the no subjectiveness of golf, uh, in comparison to some of the other team sports. Um, so started playing and I certainly by no means was any magical junior and amateur. I I did well, um, qualified for the Canadian juniors and the Canadian AMs and and did all that stuff. But, um, you know, I, I couldn't even tell you, I mean, BC junior, I don't think I ever won it. Um, 
I was on the BC team at the Canadian junior a couple times. So I would have finished top four a couple times, I think, but no wins. Um, I would say no massive notoriety. I mean, again, I was a good player, but I, and I think I was on, I never made golf Canada's junior team. Um, I think I was on an amateur team once. Um, but similar to what you were talking about, Brad, just kind of kept getting better every year, right? Some of those weaknesses got a little bit better. Uh, maybe some finishes and some junior events got a little bit better. Um, and then same thing in college. I was actually very lucky. I was a part of a golf Canada team that the university of Tennessee had invited to, they invited golf Canada to send a team down. Um, I think it was a way for them to recruit some potential players without having to do anything. Um, and so I was a part of a five man team that went down there. Um, and I played well, um, I finished, I think 18th in the event, um, as an individual, I remember playing my first, like the 36 whole day, uh, we played with, I believe it was, uh, Pepperdine and maybe East Tennessee state or something. And I remember playing with Reese Davies and Michael Putnam. There you go. (laughs) And, um, I think I beat both of them the first round and then they turned around and shot like 63, 64. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, man. Like, who are these guys? Like, I've never heard of these guys. And I, and I remember going to look them up on my golf stat and they were like three and six in the country or something at the time. And I'm like, Oh, like my eyes just went wide open. Like, wow, these guys are so good. Um, but Louisville was there and I think coach saw me swing, um, or maybe even play. I don't, I don't know how it all went. So he actually saw me in person, which I think helped immensely because again, my junior results and my amateur results were decent, but the, I don't know if they were like top tier quality school decent. And, um, but he, it was by far the best offer I had. They had a really good program. Um, when I was offered, they had, I was coming in and the freshman class before me was one of the best in the country. And so for me, it was a bit of a no brainer. I was going to get three years with these guys. And obviously I was confident in my abilities. I thought, you know, the sky's the limit for us. And, um, but even in, even in college golf, I was never, I was never great. I was a solid two, three player on the team. Um, I mean, we did have one kid that was in like the top 25 in college, so that was going to be tough to beat, but, um, I won once it was my second last event in college. I won the big East championship. Um, so it was the only time I won, um, I had worked my way up my senior year. I was honorable all American. Um, and so, yeah, I just kind of progressively got better and better, um, and then turned pro right after that. Um, and have seen the same thing in the pro game as well, just sort of progressively got better. Um, it's, you know, it took me, uh, really sort of two years on the Canadian tour to get my footing and win. Um, and then the same thing happened on the web.com now corn Ferry tour. Um, I was out there for three years, really good season, obviously in 2012, we touched on that kind of fell back in 13 and then won twice in 14. Um, and then if you look at the way I've sort of progressed through the PGA tour as well, it's very similar. Um, played well enough to keep my card, got a little bit better, got into the next round of the playoffs the following year, and then won the next year and made the tour championship. So, um, yeah, I just kind of keep getting better every year. And I, I feel like, you know, I've gotten to a certain level now where, um, things plateau probably a little bit easier than they did you know, eight, 10 years ago, there was still a lot of learning. And I feel like I've not necessarily even with the golf, just how to play, how to travel, how to manage your time, your energy levels and all of that. And I've gotten to the point now where I'm so good at all of those extra little things that it no longer had like improving those. There's no real improvement area for, you know, for those to get better. And so you kind of hit these plateaus sometimes with your game um, and you're fighting for that extra little percent, half a percent to kind of break through. And that's kind of right now. Yeah. I think you're probably at the point where you know, not necessarily that one week blends into another, but if you play well, I, I bet a lot of the time you think, yeah, it was a good week, but you didn't feel like you did anything special. 
like because you've been out there so, for so long you're you're so comfortable out there now there might be weeks where you play amazing and finish fifth or sixth but i bet right. there are weeks where you finish 10th or 12th and you think yeah i left a lot out there this week because it's just that that feeling of comfort and that feeling of and again like you said your game is pretty well rounded you don't have those highs and lows of of guys who you know take chances risk reward and all that um but but i i am i wrong in saying that or or do you think that's that's accurate like you like you said the plateaus come maybe fewer and farther between and you just feel like you're at a real level pace and it's just like one or two things click and all of a sudden you're boom in the top you know five to ten no you're a hundred percent right um you know, I've been pretty outside of the last, I would say I've kind of maybe dipped a little bit the last, you know, five, six weeks, um, or maybe give or, give or, give or take, but yeah, like the plateaus certainly keep getting higher. Right. So it used to be, you know, okay, well I, you know, my first couple of years on tour, I would go out and I would, um, miss half the cuts that I play, um, some good weeks and stuff, but, um, now it's like, if I miss three or four cups in a year, I feel like it's been a weird year. Um, so the plateau has gotten higher. Um, and then, yeah, the, when things click and, and things really start to take off, the expectation is to be in that top five and have a chance to win. Um, and at the same time, you know, I, I look at, at um, the players. I didn't think I did anything great at the players. I know that I didn't play poorly by any stretch. Um, I can look at the stats and the stats will tell me that I didn't play poorly. Um, but again, my feeling coming out of that week was, yeah, I mean, I did a lot of good things. I just didn't do any bad things. Right. I mean, would I have wanted to do, you know, miss a cut or make a, a couple more putts? Yeah, absolutely. But I, I, I did well in not making any mistakes, but I didn't do anything that left me leaving that place going, man, I really played well. Psst, that's when you know you're really good. <laughs> that's when you know you've right? got but huge, like, huge potential going forward. Yeah, but yeah. I will. But I will. I will say though, with Nick uh, last week at Zurich, that was a lot of fun. And I mean, shoot, man, we made seven birdies in a row in alternate shot, and that just doesn't happen. That's, and that, that was. Um, but again, I mean, we had a chance to win. Yeah, you know, the last couple of holes, we had a chance to win a golf tournament, and I hadn't, I hadn't felt that um, on a Sunday in a while. It's been a while since I've, I've been in a position on a Sunday to actually make a, a legit run at an event. Um, you know, again, Phoenix was close, but Sunday I was never going to win the golf tournament. Um, players, I was never going to win the golf tournament. Um, even Palm Springs, I think. I was making a run on the front nine and kind of stalled out, but I was never going to win the golf tournament, but we had a legitimate chance. And those moments are a lot of fun. And, um, you know, we're just working every single day to get into those moments as much as possible. Is that what kind of gets you excited now? Like last year at, at the U S open, I thought that was, I mean, that was just fun to follow you just from day one, you know, you were in it and you were, mm -hmm you must have felt like you were in that, you know, kind of to the bitter end. And that's, that's just on like a, a different level Are what are some of your goals and expectations, you know, for this year? Um, you know, the biggest one is to get back to the tour championship. Um, there's a lot of good things that come with tour championship. Um, you know, I could almost argue now a little bit with all of the changes that just getting to the BMW might be enough. Um, I don't want to limit myself to, to just the top 50, but with all of the changes that they've made, I know that it probably doesn't get you the majors still, um, which is why tour championship is so important. Um, right. But yeah, the biggest one is to make tour championship every single year. Um, I want to get back in the winner's circle as quickly as possible. Um, outside of those two, those are kind of the two more like outcome based goals that I would have. The other ones are more, um, like statistical based goals, like big one for me, I wanted to be positive stroke strokes gain driving. That was a big one for me. I've been negative like the last three or four years. 
Okay. Um, and I know it's obviously not easy for, again, we've talked about length. Um, it's not easy for a guy of my length to be positive. I, I have to hit more fairways, but it is possible. And I've trended in that direction those these last three or four months, which is really great to see. Um, I wanted to hit a certain percentage of fairways. I think I listed it above 70% or not fairways. I'm sorry, greens. I wanted to hit above 70% of my greens, um, this year. Cause I thought that would give me a really good opportunity to score well. Um, so there's, there's a few other statistical things that I, that I kind of wanted to hit. Um, I'm on pace for some and I'm a little lagging on some others, but um, I don't set a ton of outcome goals just because I want to focus on the reasons that will, the, the ways that I can get to those outcomes. So. Sounds boring, but the process is yeah, everything. Process, right. yeah. yeah. Um, well, you're positive in uh, strokes gained off the tee so far this year. Yeah. So let's hope that yeah. keep trending uh, 100%. in that direction. Uh, so on tour, I'm sure there are a bunch of tournaments that you look forward to. Let's take out the Canadian Open, uh, the Masters in the U.S. Open, maybe Phoenix. Like, What is one event that you really love to play that might be under the radar? Um, I mean, Memorial is not really under the radar. Um, it's always a big event. Um, but I do like going to, to Jack's event. They do a really good job with us. Um, it's a very difficult golf course and probably not one that really suits my game, but I, I think Columbus is a, a great spot and I like the area. Um, uh, Genesis at Riv is always a good place. I love going to Riv. Uh, it's one of my favorite places. I complain about it every year, but it's still one of my favorite places. <laughs> what do you complain about? The greens? No, the Kakuya, the Kakuya ah, grass. It's it's go. one of like very few places that um if it gets firmer, which it, you know, California hasn't seen a ton of rain in the last few years. Spotty rain, I should say. Um so when it gets firmer, it's you know, the grass in front of the greens, you land it a yard short and the grass kills it and it won't really bounce up. But if you land it, you know, a step or two on, you'll bounce over the back of the green. Sometimes there's a, there's a few holes like 15 is an example. It's just such a tough green to hit when it's firm because anything near the front, you can't get at, you're basically just hitting it 35, 40 feet behind the hole. And then if you tried to just hit a lower shot to run it up or something, it just gets killed in the grass and you're, mm -hmm. and you're chipping. And so, um, but I love the fact that Riv, there's no water hazards, there's no out of bounds. It's, it's in front of you and it plays very difficult every single year. So, um, from a tournament perspective, I think that the John Deere is underrated. I think they do an incredible job at that event, the community, uh, the sponsor, John Deere itself, opening up the test site, having the big dig for the families, um, you know, the staff, the clubhouse, everything around that event, I think is really good. Um, you know, people talk about the travelers travelers does a, a, an amazing job as well. Um, I love they get that massive, golf course. Yeah. It's I'm, so much I've it's played, just fun. I know. And I've played it terribly. <laughs> I like, I, I honestly, I mean, in like, I don't know, six or seven years, I've probably only made two cuts. I mean, it's, it's, it's unreal. I, I would, it should be, I think what happens at travelers is that I maybe get tricked into being a little bit more aggressive probably than I should be sometimes, you know, I talked about how, I, yeah, like I'm not an aggressive player. I'm not an yeah. overly go for it. I'm a very conservative center, of the green, lay it back, take the risk out of it kind of guy. And I think that my issue there is that i've tried to be a little too aggressive at times potentially um and tried to take too much on and maybe that's because other guys are making birdies they're pulling shots off and they're making birdies and if you think i gotta i gotta make birdies but um maybe kind of gets away from my game my traditional game a little bit but um they do a really good job um you know i mean in all fairness most every event we play do a really good job. Right. I mean, Brad, you can, you can speak to that as well. Like we're it's first class. I mean, if, if you have a, if you have a complaint about what we're doing, 
<laughs> or how we're getting treated at times. I mean, it's, you might have to look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. Right? Okay. And, 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 about to say that. <laughs> and, and even more so now in these last couple of years with the amount of money that we're playing for, right? I mean, we're, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, you've ne- they've never had a reason uh, to worry about retaining players, but now they do. So I imagine yeah. uh, that the treatment of players has gone even more above and beyond as as I've experienced it. I guess my last year was 2017, so it was a while ago. But yeah, yeah, I could I could definitely uh, see that happening. Adam, we don't want to keep you too much longer. Uh, we always end our podcast with three questions and you can go as long or as short as you want. Uh, but but I'll go, I'll go first. If you had to dial golf down to one single memory that's etched in your brain that you'll never forget, what is it for you? Um, man, there's so many that stand out. Um, I would say, though, that walking up the 18th at Shaughnessy in the Canadian Open. Nice. Yeah. To that to that ovation, given the spot that I was in my career, I think was one of the most incredible things that um, I know I had goosebumps. Um, it was yeah, one of the most incredible things that I've I've been a part of. And, you know, uh, yeah. I don't admire many golfers, but that was, I remember, I didn't know you very well. Uh, maybe hardly at all. Like we were playing the Canadian tour at the time and I had Monday yeah. qualified into that event and Darren Griff caddied for me actually, which as you can imagine was a hoot. Um, but I remember thinking like, I made the cut, whatever, but I can't imagine playing that well, being as raw as you were, and handling all that in your not hometown, but you know, home right. province Close. and everything. Like yeah. I was, I had a lot of admiration for that week uh, for you. I was like, man, this guy is, I don't, I don't know how you did. That was my opinion at the time. Like, I don't know how he's doing it, but yeah, that yeah. was, that was an amazing week uh, more so for you than for me. But I was, uh, <laughs> I, I was a big admirer of that particular performance. I remember. Thank you. Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure if you, if you had asked me that week, I'm not sure. I would have been able to answer how I was doing it, but um, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. That, that's cool that you would say that. I mean, that's a big memory for me. Like there hasn't been other than Mike Weir, you know, kind of battling at Glen Abbey, you know, Canadians are always rooting for, you know, yeah. someone, some Canadian to, to be in the mix. And, and you were there, you know, hometown, tough course, awesome, beautiful course. So that's, yeah. that's cool. I mean, you've, you've shot 59 on tour and one, and that's the one that kind of jumps out at you. So that, that's kind of neat. Well, maybe that'll take us to our, our second question, which is, you know, what's that feeling from golf that keeps bringing you back? And, you know, and it doesn't have to be, obviously, you know, you, you play this game at the highest level, but, you know, is that, you know, around a, a at dusk, is it, you know, competing on Sunday? Is it, you know, a buddy's trip? Like, what is it about golf that kind of like does it for you, this, this game? You know, I think it, it depends on, I think there's a few things that, that do it for me. Um, I don't think there's anything better than going out on a, you know, a crisp, fall or spring day with dew on the ground bag on your back, walking around and playing 18 by yourself. Um, but I think the biggest thing for me is being in that moment and having a chance to win. I think that's what keeps me coming back. And honestly, more than anything, the failure of it. Um, not that it is necessarily a failure. Um, I liked kind of what Giannis had to say, um, the other day when asked about failure, that there is no failure in sports. It's just a preparation for the next time. Um, but not, um, not getting the job done, not executing, I guess, um, when you most need it. I think that's what brings me back. 
because I feel like there's something else there. And, um, you know, I, where I just, there's this, this always this endless chase, you know, we're always chasing perfection. And I think at the end of the day, we all recognize that we're not going to be perfect, but I think we all know that we're all just chasing to see how close we can get to being perfect. And, um, you know, the more times you do that, the closer you get to that, the more times you're in contention to win tournaments. And that's, you know, those butterflies, those nerves, looking at the leaderboard, seeing where you're at and knowing that this putt means something, not that it doesn't mean something when you're trying to get from 15th to eighth or whatever, every putt means something. But I think we can all agree that when you know you have a putt to take the outright lead with a couple of holes to go, it means something more. So that's a great answer. And Very that's cool. coming, and that's coming from the guy who shot 59 before. So he's about as close to perfect <laughs> one time, at least that we can possibly get Uh last one for you, Adam. It's a little bit of a, a lighter um, subject, but uh, we always, we, in our business, uh, we sell golf gloves and we, give a golf glove to a junior uh, program or community golf program for every glove that we sell. And so we always like our guests to uh, highlight a, a foundation or an organization that is, that is giving back to the game of golf. Maybe you have one. Uh, I think you run a tournament every year. So maybe just uh, if you want to highlight that for us, uh, we always like to hear about it. Yeah. So I do a couple different things now. Um, we still, we've ran an event, uh, in the Vancouver area for, gosh, I don't know, 10 plus years now. Um, it's been at least seven or eight in a row, um, outside of COVID, but, um, we've raised money for the child foundation, a little bit different than the, um, giving back to the golf community, but my brother was diagnosed with Crohn's at an early age. And so we became introduced to the child foundation, which stands for children with intestinal liver disorders um, early on as a family. And, um, the work that they do is trying to put an end to some of those, um, diseases, figuring out where they are and, and if there is prevention for that so that, um, you know, other kids and adults don't have to, to live through that. And so we've raised a lot of money for them. I think we're over a million dollars in the last seven, eight years for that. Um, and then just more recently, my wife and I started our own foundation down here in the, the U S where we're based. Um, and it is dealing with, um, in a broad sense, the, uh, sort of the hardships that can come with having children. Um, so my wife and I, we had to go through IVF to have our daughter and, um, we both kind of looked at each other at the end of it and said, this, this doesn't seem right that we basically, uh, it sounds kind of brass, but like bought a child per se. Um, you know, like we could afford to go through this to have, you know, um, a child. And so that was part of the, um, reasoning behind the foundation. Um, and so we do an IVF grant actually to other families that, are doing the same thing that we did. It's, it's run at the same clinic that we use in Arizona. Um, but we also do some other stuff with the foundation and working with other children's charities. Uh, we also have a grant with the Kansas Children's Foundation or Kansas uh, Pediatrics. Uh, or, sorry, I'm going to get this wrong. My wife is way better at this than I am. But the University of Kansas Pediatrics. Uh, we have a grant with them and they have a genetics department. Um, and so it's not just uh, pregnancy related, uh, but also uh, post-pregnancy, um, you know, trying to figure out uh, a diagnosis for a, a sick child and stuff like that. So we have a grant uh, running through them that uh, helps with some potential genetic testing that families may need. Um, that insurance might not cover or they might not be able to afford and stuff. So uh, we're, we're trying to grow our footprint. Um, we have a golf event. We're going to start up a top golf event as in Wichita here as well, where we are in the summer. And um, so, yeah, not quite golf related. What no, I've been but doing. That's, 
Um, I learned something new today, man. That's amazing. Yeah. Good for you guys. But I, what's what's the, the website for that? I, that is the www.thehadwinfamilyfoundation.org. Um, yeah, it'll tell you everything you need to know. It'll probably be a much better description than what I'm telling you guys right now. Um, but uh, I also try and do as much as I can with like the first T and organization, organizations like that, just so that I don't leave golf completely behind because this is golf has given me this opportunity and this platform to, to do some of these things. So I want to make sure that, um, I continue to give back in that area as well. That's awesome because that was basically our message when we started the company was golf has given us different things, but both provided a lifetime of memories and, and given us, uh, a reprieve from ordinary life yeah. as well, because golf is uh therapy for Carrie and mm-hmm. yeah. So that's great, man. Hey man, I really appreciate you making time from Wichita, Kansas this evening to, uh, to join us. Of course. And uh, I wish you the best uh, going forward. What is your next event that you're playing? I'll be in Charlotte next week. Wells awesome. Fargo. Quail hollow. Yeah. Love that place. Uh, yeah. Good luck to you, Adam. Thanks a lot. Thanks Thank Adam. Appreciate your time. Uh, love following you. Wish you all the best this year. Uh, rooting for you. I appreciate it. Absolutely. No problems at all. Thank you guys. Thanks, right. buddy. Man, Adam, such a good guy. So good of him to make time. And uh, our first guest that can actually beat me. So that's uh, <laughs> that's saying something. <laughs> I wasn't going to bring it up with him. He might get a big head. Uh, but yeah, great, great uh, 45 minutes with Adam. What struck you uh, especially about that? Uh, talk with Adam Hadwin. The timing was great. Um, just, uh, you know, the, a week ago he, you know, I had a chance to win a PJ tour event. And, uh, so to get him on, on, on his week off, I thought timing was amazing to just kind of pick his brain, but it was interesting to hear, like, I've, I've followed his career. I, I remember, uh, you know, when he sort of popped onto the scene, uh, at the Canadian open and to, to hear how big an impact that had, like maybe that's his, his most memorable moment from golf period. Um, that, that was, you know, an interesting perspective, but even just kind of like where I hear this more and more, and I, I wish I would have asked him this question, but just this, he mentioned how conservative he is as a player. And I thought like, that's so interesting. Like this is a guy who shot 59 and, you know, maybe on the surface, you know, if I don't know his game that well, I might think like, Hey, this guy's a, he just fires at pins and like, you don't shoot 59 by playing conservative, but obviously like, um, I don't know if that was like, you know, a mind shift or if he's, he's just gotten better. And that's, you know, something that you've mentioned as well. Um, so it's, um, it's something that, you know, I've never sort of seen myself as a conservative player necessarily. And then you just think of tour players as just being like run and gun. And, and instead of really like playing the high percentages and letting the birdies come. Yeah. I, I don't know the numbers for the PGA tour, you know, offhand, but if I had to guess every PGA tour player averages between about 3.75 and five birdies around five would be super high. I doubt anyone averages five. Um, so where's it at? It's not making bogeys, right? How do you make bogeys short side over aggressive? Obviously you can spray a drive or two and, and have that issue, but, um, yeah, it's about hitting greens, giving yourself opportunities. That's why so often you hear guys talk about, I played really well. I just didn't make any putts, didn't score. You know, that's when you're not making the the eight footer. That's about a 50% putt on the PGA tour. That's about the average of an eight footer. I think a lot of people would be surprised by that. Right, um, they would, but, but you start scoring and you make a bunch of those uh, and some other rounds you don't, but maybe you lump those together into two or three rounds. And all of a sudden you've got a chance to win on Sunday. Um, but it, it was interesting to hear Adam kind of talk about his career pro- progression. And personally, I think it has a lot to do with his just maturation as a person on the golf course, uh, off the golf course, getting married, having a child, all that stuff makes you just so much more grounded in that golf is not the most important thing anymore. 
And uh, for me personally, I started playing better when I had more responsibility to my family. It was less about me. And uh, as Adam's gotten older, like he was a firecracker on the course early on. Uh, and he played well at times. Like obviously his, his early career was uh, in part spectacular a lot of the times, even when sure, he was yeah. a Canadian tour player. You know, he had PGA tour events, success, all that stuff. Uh, but you see the consistency as he gets older, which happens a lot, um, and and his his on course demeanor is just so much more mellow. I'm sure the fire burns inside uh, a lot, but you can just tell he's so, so at peace with kind of how his life is going, and and you know just like he said that one or two extra shots gets you into the Masters instead of not in or into the tour championship, which is so important. So uh, it was great to catch up with him. He's such a, a great player and, and kind of a model of, you know, a lot of the listeners can probably relate to him because he's not a long bomber. He can, you know, his average, I think right now is 294 uh, off the tee. And so a lot of people can relate to being, you know, you're not hitting at 320 yards like the the long guys uh, out on the PGA tour. So uh, it was great to catch up with him. So I I thank him for, for joining us. And I hope the listeners uh, learned a lot about him because he's, uh, he's just a a really nice, I I call him guy. He's a really nice man. He's a 35 year old man. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Hey, let's do some, uh, some listener questions, Carrie. Absolutely. Okay. I got, uh, I've got two picked out here. Um, this is when I kind of take for granted sometimes, I guess, just sort of make this assumption. I don't know if we should have it on the website or not, but uh, a question comes from Richard Martin. And uh, how did you select Red Rooster as the name of the company? I, I had someone else ask me this today, so it was kind of top of mind. And I guess not not everybody knows, but um, yeah, that's my nickname. So I grew up, I was... Uh, my dad used to call me the red rooster. I was the only one with, with red hair. I had red hair at some point. My kids say I don't have it anymore. Um, and, uh, I, I have a couple of uh, redheads in, in our family, a couple daughters that will, uh, carry that legacy forward. And, um, but yeah, that's, that, that's fairly simple. I think the other reason why we came up with that name is we threw it in, it was a nickname and it was sort of a placeholder but we couldn't beat it with anything else. And we didn't want to come up with just some sort of golfism, some back nine golf club or players golf club, et cetera. So it, uh, it stuck, especially once we saw the logo and we came up with the the tagline, you know, wake up your golf game. It, uh, it sort of uh, stuck and, uh, and grew on us. So that's, that's the history of, of red rooster and how we selected that. Yeah, I re- I remember when when you said it, I kind of I didn't cringe, but I thought, well, we're gonna have to come up with something better than that. Uh, but then I learned about branding and being unique and being memorable, and and it's the logo is certainly one that you remember. Um, and and yeah, we we tried to come up with something, but nothing came up. And I think in the end, uh, it was to our benefit. So good, uh, it was a great placeholder, Carrie. Yeah, uh, it was interesting. Well, um, our buddy Chris Hen sent us a, a picture of, was it Greenville Golf Club? that Greenville Country Club in South Carolina, Greenville, South Carolina. Yeah, and it was almost a dead ringer. It was close. <laughs> no uh, club, real, but... <laughs> real close. <laughs> so you see that, you see that, uh, that logo, you know, the rooster, a lot of different places and, and, I think people would be surprised. There's a lot of people out there, a lot of golfers who are nicknamed the rooster in their either men's leagues or, or whatever. We get those emails uh, quite a bit. So it's fun to hear that stuff. Yeah, we do for sure. Um, And here's another one that just sort of somewhat timely and uh, just a a question, you know, do we recommend uh, a range finder? And I think, you know, there's, there's obviously like lots of great, range finders in, in the market right now. And we've struck up um, you know, just a great collaboration with with another direct-to-consumer brand that we've got a lot of respect for, uh, Precision Pro. And uh, so we're working on a, a really fun collaboration 
to to co-brand their NX10 rangefinder. So uh, that uh, that'll be coming out shortly. I think you know there's there's a lot of great rangefinders on the market, and this is this was this is arguably the best. You know, it's got a lot of the best reviews, and um, and we think really sort of uh, fits with our audience. Another great you know direct to consumer brand that's you know come in and kind of upset the big guys. Uh, so we've aligned with them for this, uh, drop should be ready by mid June. And, uh, and then we can get, uh, everybody's feedback on that. What, what's been kind of the evolution for you, Brad, with, with range finders, you know, there was a time when you, you know, literally, you know, couldn't use them. And now I know, you know, the story of the guy on the European tour who zapped it on the first hole and got DQ'd. What, what's your kind of stance on range finders where they currently stand? Well, I remember the first ones looked like a pair of binoculars, right? They were, oh, yeah. Like you had to have two hands on them. <laughs> those two were, uh, I think those you had to beauties. have like a chin strap. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, range finders for me are they're a great tool. Um, they're they make casual golf uh quicker, but when it comes to the pro game, I think you just have to be careful when you're managing your game, managing your score that you don't get too locked in. Uh, on that number on the flag, because what did we talk about five minutes ago? Like playing conservatively, manage your, managing your game so you don't short side yourself. And I think my issue when I have a range finder in competition, which I have used in mini tour events, they're allowed in Monday qualifiers. Right. They're allowed in any PGA of America event, including the PGA Championship. Um, again, it's a great tool to get the literal yardage, but uh, between player and caddy, most of the time, you talk about the front number, anything you have to cover after that, which may be a bunker or a ridge or anything like that. And then the last number uh, you'll hear from the caddy is usually the pin number. Uh, and a lot of times you don't care about that number. You're just trying to right. get the best best putt at it. So um, I'm in favor of range finders. I'm not necessarily in favor of them for uh, you know the PGA Tour events because on TV, I just think it's a bad look. And I think having a caddy who can run through the process quick and and relay everything to the player and have a quick conversation i think that's part of the game i think it's uh an important part of the player caddy relationship and uh there's nothing more entertaining when the caddy adds instead of subtracts or vice versa get the wrong number and they look at each other like huh what sure, happened? Like, <laughs> those are sure, a those, bit of drama. It's yeah, great. Yeah. You see those yeah. once in a while. Uh, there's a great Paul Casey reaction uh, with his caddy. I think it's on number nine of East Lake. Uh, you'll see the video on YouTube and running around on Facebook sometimes. He hits the shot and it just rockets across the green. And he <laughs> looks at his caddy and he looks back at the club, looks at his caddy. And I think he mouths, like, Are, are you sure about that? Like, it's a, such a great little video and that's good um, you need that yeah you you need you need some tense moments out there yeah i mean hey th- some guys fold under pressure and and i there there are times in my long golf career where i've kind of caught my caddy like are you sure like it doesn't look like it i know i hit my drive like this so therefore it should only be you know around this yardage and all of a sudden you're giving me 20 more or 20 less than i thought uh, it happened and it happens to the player too, because I used to get my own yardages, but, uh, full circle back to precision pro. I'm excited about that collaboration. We'll have a nice red rooster, uh, logo on that thing. And I think people kind of, uh, uh, dig it and, 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 and I hope, uh, people like it. Yeah, right on. Well, I, I've had a few mishaps on my own, uh, you know, either <laughs> I remember getting like halfway through a round and realizing like, it's on meters instead of yards or <laughs> literally you know, had right. that the other day um, with a guy in my group. And, and he said, after we figured out, he goes, man, I thought I was hitting my iron so different the last couple of weeks. I'm like, yep. It was on M not Y like you see you, so, you big dummy. <laughs> Drama is good. hundred uh, percent. Carrie, let everyone know where they can find us. Well, Brad, it's it's so easy. Um, all you have to do, if you're looking for Red Rooster, you'll find us at Red Rooster Golf on all of our social hand- handles or redroostergolf.com. 
Awesome. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode of the Red Rooster Golf Podcast and a special thanks to PGA Tour player Adam Hadwin. For my partner, Carrie Moher, I am Brad Fritch. We'll see you again soon. Until then, tee it high, let it fly, and cock-a-doodle-doo.